assaults on the black community and on black individuals were a common feature of Philadelphia black life. You know, you have all of these free blacks who are flooding into the north. You got to compete for jobs and also for political power as well. There was a lot of violence, I mean, in terms of uh, hatred for Africans, deep hatred for African people. It was not a nice place for a black person to be. Slavery existed on the banks of the Delaware since at least the 1630s, long before there even was a Philadelphia. It's a very uh, small number, but it's present. Prominent Quakers like John Dickinson, Isaac Norris, and James Logan owned slaves. Even Pennsylvania founder William Penn was a slaveholder. Like many friends, many Quakers, William Penn was ambivalent about what to do about slaves. In 1688, a small group of Quakers meeting in Germantown penned the first written protest against slavery in the American colonies. They are ignored, put down, they shut up, no one's interested. Quakers like Anthony Benazette kept the controversy alive with published pamphlets arguing the immorality of slaveholding. In 1775, the Society of Friends took a stand. You have to make a choice. You may be a member of our community or you may hold slaves. It didn't convince the majority of the people in Philadelphia, but it was a statement that was being made that would eventually uh, make Philadelphia one of the uh, leading centers for uh, abolition in the country. Benazette founded the Pennsylvania Abolition Society. They actually provided education and uh, were very instrumental in helping uh, f newly freed blacks really kind of get on their feet they worked closely with the Free African Society, a charitable organization started by Richard Allen and Absalom Jones, two former slaves who started the nation's earliest black churches, the African Episcopal Church of St. Thomas and Mother Bethel African Methodist Episcopal Church. It did give them a sense of place, a, a sense of control over their own both economic and religious destiny. When a group called the American Colonization Society formed in 1816, intent on sending blacks back to Africa, Mother Bethel's members organized a massive opposition. 3,000 black people gathered here at Mother Bethel to protest the American Colonization Society. I mean, it was incredible. Nothing like that had ever happened before. In the 1830s, James Fortin, an African-American sailmaker and one of the city's wealthiest citizens, helped found the American Anti-Slavery Society. The anti-slavery society was far more aggressive. Uh, it demands uh, an end to uh, racial discrimination and discriminatory laws against black people. It demands equal opportunity and equal rights for everyone. The increasingly bold tactics rub the raw nerves of racist society. This is a period of mob violence directed against abolitionists and anti-slavery people. You have the meetings howled down, shouted down, met with bricks and rotten fruit. To provide protection, Robert Purvis, an ardent abolitionist, formed the Vigilant Association. The group helped escaped slaves stay in or pass through Philadelphia in what would become known as the Underground Railroad. So two at a time, you can go up and follow in the path of the fugitives. Philadelphia was very key in the Underground Railroad system, and it had a very well-disciplined network. People like William Still, who in 1847 found work as a clerk in the Pennsylvania Anti-Slavery Society office and was soon running the day-to-day -day operations of the city's Underground Railroad. And Francis Ellen Watkins Harper, a journalist, novelist, and poet who wrote prolifically about the oppression of women and African Americans and worked tirelessly at Still's side. They make announcements in the black churches, you know, keep your eyes open, let us know, and uh, they exploit all the resources of the big city. The outbreak of civil war spawned a new generation of leaders in Philadelphia, including a young teacher named Octavius Cato. Octavius Cato is perhaps, in Philadelphia's history, the single most charismatic figure that the African American community has ever produced. Cato was a scholar and an athlete, civically and politically active. When the state put out an emergency call for war volunteers, he was eager to prove the worth of his people. And so he develops a black regiment and goes off to Harrisburg to try to get that regiment 
recognized. And the governor refused to accept them. He said, no, no, we're not going to have black people. A week later, Congress approved African-American enlistees, and Caddo worked relentlessly, recruiting soldiers to train at Camp William Penn, the nation's largest and Pennsylvania's only training camp for soldiers of color. But the location on the Elkins Park estate of abolitionist Lucretia Mott created a hardship as many African Americans lived in Center City. Their families could not visit them. Their wives, the mothers, were not allowed on streetcars. William still had been protesting this since about 1859, but it becomes, you know, particularly nasty when folks can't go see their kids at Camp William Penn. While still had appealed to white authorities to change the law, Caddo and his fiancée, Caroline LeCount, took a more direct approach. They would just abhor the, uh, you know, the streetcars and defy people to throw them off, which they did. The tactic worked. In 1867, the state legislature desegregated streetcars. The next time LeCount was kicked off, she walked to Old City Hall and demanded justice. Represented herself as her own lawyer, and Judge Allison ruled in her favor and found the conductor guilty. The streetcar battle won. Caddo moved on to bigger issues. As a leader of the Equal Rights League, he worked with Frederick Douglass to help win the right to vote for African Americans and ran a huge get-out-the-vote operation in Philadelphia's pivotal mayoral election of 1871. You know, the white Democrats you know, see this as sort of you know, the death knell of their dominance. You have all these potential new voters who would be voting for the party of Lincoln. If they can perhaps even hold office and have some form of you know, political authority over us. They were quite enraged by this. Angry mobs of Democratic Party operatives rained assault down on their black neighbors. Caddo was gunned down on the street, one of three African Americans killed that day. Not only do you have a person who lost his life simply trying to exercise his right to vote, but you really lost uh, some of the intellect of the community on that day. Thousands turned out for Caddo's funeral, the biggest the city had seen since Lincoln's. And the white Republicans did him proud. Uh, they appreciated what he was going to do for the party. Uh, they appreciated how he was going to mobilize the black community. They appreciated him as a player. He was very popular with the uh, Republican Party. Uh, he was very popular with the uh, African people who were engaged in, uh, in professional life. And uh, he also had uh, the masses of black folk on his side. The death of the rising star only solidified the power of the party of Lincoln. And it led to a welding of the majority of Philadelphia African Americans to uh, almost bootlicking subordinate and obedience to the Republican machine. A hold the Republican Party would maintain for nearly 80 years. <laughs>